please open up your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 6. Uh, Pastor Tommy asked me if I could just continue on in Acts where we left off last Sunday. And of course, I'm delighted to do it. We pick it up in the middle of Acts chapter 6. I'm going to begin at verse 8. And we're going to go through to the end of the chapter. We love just to walk through books of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We believe this is how God's brought his word to us. And this is how we can best understand it together. The general theme in this section in the book of Acts is how the work of God, the work of the Holy Spirit in and through his people, it's absolutely unstoppable. Nothing can stop it. It's continuing on. And even though opposition was coming, even though corruption threatened from within, even though there was a threat of real dispute and division among God's people, things were continuing and God was moving in a powerful, mighty way. And... Whenever God's moving, one of the ways he's moving is through people. I mean, God doesn't send down angels from heaven to preach the gospel or to do his work. He's not going to send down angels from heaven to help out with with the kids in our uh, centers here that we're doing here and helping out uh, kids in the community who need a little more access to the internet or help with that. God's looking for us to respond to his call and to do that work. And so one of the men that God raised up, we saw earlier in Acts chapter 6, was this man named Stephen. And now we learn more about Stephen, beginning at verse 8. Let's take a look at this, verses 8, 9, and 10, Acts chapter 6. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Remarkable words about this man, Stephen. Did you see what it said about him in verse 8? Look at that with me. It says, Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Now, this is something that I find remarkable in the book of Acts, because up to this point, We've seen God do remarkable signs and wonders in the book of Acts, but we've seen him do those things through the apostles. You know, the apostles, those 12 disciples that Jesus specially chose, specially poured into, specially commissioned. We've seen God do great signs and wonders through the apostles. You'll find a mention of that in Acts chapter 2, verse 43. In Acts chapter 5, verse 12, it speaks of many signs and wonders were done. And that is, again, through the apostles. But this is what's amazing about verse 8. Verse 8 tells us that it wasn't only among the apostles that God was doing these things. I mean, really, isn't that remarkable? Wouldn't we maybe think that just those 12, because those 12 were special men, there's no doubt God has a special place for them in his plan. But those weren't the only ones through whom God was working in this way. Stephen is an example of another person who was not an apostle that God did, as it says there in verse 8, great wonders and signs through. Now, we all want to know, what were these great wonders and signs? I don't know. The text doesn't tell us. I can tell you this. They were not magicians' tricks. I can tell you this. They weren't just sort of fireworks to impress the people. No, that wasn't it. Almost certainly, these were examples of the compassion of God demonstrated in miraculous ways. Sicknesses were healed. Poverty was relieved. Demonic possession was loosed. God was doing remarkable things through Stephen. You see, everybody knows that Jesus did amazing, miraculous things. That's full in the gospel record. But some people say this. They say, well, look, that was different. That was Jesus. And we're not Jesus. And of course, we're not Jesus. I'm not Jesus. I certainly hope you know that you're not Jesus. So we'd say it's Jesus doing it, not us. But then We know that God did amazing, miraculous things through the apostles. Those original and sort of special 12 followers of Jesus. But some people say, well, that's different. 
They were the apostles. They had to prove that they could carry on the ministry of Jesus and that they had the authority to bring forth the New Testament. That's why God did those miracles through them, just as a badge or a credential of them being apostles. But if that's the case, how do we explain what verse 8 says? I'll read it to you again. Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Stephen was not Jesus. Stephen was not one of the apostles. You know what Stephen was? He was an administrator. He was a bookkeeper. He was an organizer. He cared for the widows among the early Christians. He never wrote a book of the Bible. He never needed any special miraculous attestation. Not at all. We never see that in the ministry, so to speak, of Stephen. Listen, this shows me something I believe that's very important. It shows me that God is still interested in the miraculous. God's interest in the miraculous did not end with the ministry of Jesus. It did not end with the ministry of the apostles. It carried on to men like Stephen. Now, I cannot explain, and I'm going to be bold enough to say, you cannot explain why God grants a miracle in one place and why he does not in another. We're not in control of these things. We don't know why God sometimes uses a human agency in doing something, and sometimes he does not. Sometimes he does it absolutely unilaterally. But this is what we know. God is still doing miracles today. And that's something we see exciting from the ministry of Stephen. I want you to look again at verse 8 just for a moment. It says, and Stephen, full of faith and power. Now, I want to bring this little line up just as an example. There is a dispute in the manuscripts that give us our modern Bibles. There's a dispute whether or not Luke, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, originally wrote, full of faith and power. That's what it reads in my New King James Version. Or whether it says, full of grace and power. If some of you have the ESV version, version, you see it looks like, okay, grace and power. And so there's a textual dispute. Some manuscripts say faith and power. Some manuscripts say grace and power. Now, this is what I want you to consider. This is an example of a manuscript textual problem that concerns people. You'll find people, I don't necessarily recommend that you go out looking for them, but you'll find them if you are. Oh, you can't trust the New Testament. Those ancient manuscripts are absolutely riddled with mistakes and errors. It's all over. You can't trust what's in your New Testament. Forget about it. It, it, It's not trustworthy. This is the kind of problem, and I put that in scare quotes, problem they're talking about. Brothers, I've got a simple question. Whether it's faith and power or grace and power, does it change anything in the meaning of the text? Does it change anything in what it's telling us? No, it it could go either way, and you could decide. You can weigh the manuscript evidence. But this should not concern anybody in the slightest way about the reliability of the Bible that we possess. And the reason I bring that up is because there's some voices out there. They're loud. They're very confident. Well, you can't trust your Bible. The texts are all corrupt. Who knows what it says? That's not true. It's not true at all. We have every reason to believe that our New Testament and the Old Testament as well is reliable. It's trustworthy and we can have confidence. You look at this, you go, look, if you think this is the kind of thing that's a problem, I don't care. And we move on to the next thing. Now, let's move on to verse 9. It says there, Then there arose from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and though from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. So these Jewish people, presumably men, 
They were arguing. They were from a particular synagogue. And he showed greater wisdom than these opponents. Look at how it went in verse 10. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Stephen, inspired by the Holy Spirit, was able to stand his ground. Matter of fact, win the arguments against these opponents, so to speak. You know, there's no indication for us that Stephen in himself was smarter or better educated or a better debater than these religious leaders. Then why did he do so well in these debates, these disputes? Because of the spirit by which he spoke, as it says there in verse 10. God's spirit was with him and empowering us. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, there's something in me that says, man, I would love to have some of that. I would love to have the spirit's power on me to give me the ability to really uh, speak well when I have to debate or dispute for the cause of Jesus Christ. But let me tell you, one aspect of that is that Stephen put himself out to do that work. Look, if you want to experience more of the Holy Spirit's power, you get out there and do something for Jesus Christ. Just step out. One of the great things about our congregation over the decades is that we're very concerned for missions. And we've sent out a lot of people, younger people, not so young people, on missions teams. And so often when people come back from a mission team, they're so excited because they feel that God used them in such a remarkable way. And they felt the Holy Spirit working in them and through them. Well, you know why? It's not because the Holy Spirit's more present in a different country than he is right here in Santa Barbara. It's because when you step out and are bold to do something for Jesus, you're going to find that the Holy Spirit is poured out you on you in a remarkable way. That's exactly what was happening right here with Stephen. All right, let's move on to verse 11. He's winning all the arguments. So what's the opposition from the other side? <laughs> You know, instead of coming up with better arguments, this is what the other side does. Verse 11. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. They could not answer Stephen's arguments. They could not get the better of him in a fair debate. So what did they do? Look again at verse 11. They secretly induced men to say. They used lies and secret strategies to shape popular opinion against Stephen. Because they couldn't win the arguments. Now, again, I find something very interesting in verse 11. Did you see that word in there? They secretly induced men. And I said, well, okay. If it was a secret, then how do you know about it, Luke? M Mr. Luke, author of the book of Acts, or at least the human author, we know that it was inspired by God. But if it was so secret, how do you know about it, Luke? What's interesting here? Because when Luke describes for us, if you notice right there, it says in verse uh, 9, there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia. There was a very prominent rabbi who had lived in Jerusalem for some time, but was originally from Cilicia. His name was Saul of Tarsus. And we know that Saul, as we're going to find out later on, was mixed up in this whole thing. I don't have any doubt that it was Saul of Tarsus who, when he was converted, later became more known through the name 
Paul, the Apostle Paul, I don't have any doubt that it was Saul of Tarsus that told Luke, this is what we secretly came up with. Let me tell you the behind the scenes. And, and you know, it's just little nuggets like that, that again, give me so much confidence in the word of God. It connects the dots to me and lets me know that this is real history given to us by eyewitnesses, by ear witnesses, people who were actually there. And what did they do? Again, let's take a look at verse 12. It says, and they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him. The opponents of Stephen could do nothing against him and other followers of Jesus until they first got popular opinion on their side. Previously, in the book of Acts, we read it in Acts chapter 2, verse 47. We also get an indication of it in Acts chapter 5, verse 26. Previously in the book of Acts, it tells us that the Christians had great favor with the common people. And that's how it was before. But I want you to notice something. Previously, Christians had great favor with the common people. But here, through skillful lies and deceptions, they were able to, look at verse 12, stir up the people against Stephen and the Christians. Brothers and sisters, popular opinion can be easily shaped. The same crowds that praised Jesus at the triumphal entry soon called for his crucifixion a few days later. The crowds that loved the apostles, again in Acts chapter 2 and in Acts chapter 5, here they cry out against Stephen. This is one reason why we as believers should never let popular opinion shape the vision or the focus of the church. The vision and the focus of the church needs to be shaped by God's word, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and not simply by popular opinion. Sometimes the world will see who we are and what we do, and they'll say, Wow, isn't it wonderful? And sometimes they won't. Sometimes they will stir up lies and deceptions against us. Look at it right here in verse 11. We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. Did Stephen ever speak blasphemous words against Moses and God? No, it was a lie. Verse 13. This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. Again, he didn't do that, but they accused him of it. Verse 14, Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change customs. Does anybody here in this room think that Stephen actually preached that? No, he did not. And what I find interesting is that these were many of the same accusations that were brought against Jesus himself when Jesus was on trial before the council. And look, if you're being accused of the same things Jesus was accused of, you're in a pretty good place. But I want you to see how Stephen clearly taught God's truth, but his opponents twisted his teaching. I see this very clearly. Look at it here. The truth that Jesus was greater than Moses, is that true? Absolutely. But that was twisted into the accusation that Stephen spoke, look at verse 11, blasphemous words against Moses. Now, is it blasphemous to say that Jesus is greater than Moses? No, it's not. Stephen never blasphemed Jesus, but they twisted his words. The truth that Jesus is God and if you're a Christian, if you believe what this book says, you believe that Jesus is God. The truth that Jesus is God was twisted into the accusation, look at verse 11, of blasphemous words against God. The truth that Jesus was greater than the temple was twisted into the accusation of, verse 13, blasphemous words against this holy place. The truth that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law 
was twisted into the accusation, verse 13, of blasphemous words against the law. And the truth that Jesus is greater than religious customs and traditions, that was twisted into the accusation. Look at verse 14, that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change customs. Folks, here's what I want you to understand. We need to communicate the message of Jesus Christ with as much clarity, with as much love, with as much grace as we can. But I want you to know, you can say everything right and you can say it in exactly the right spirit and people will still sometimes twist your words and say, you said this when you never really said it. That's how it is. Don't we see this a lot in our own country? So never assume that just because a believer is being accused of saying something outrageous, please don't jump to the conclusion that they actually said something outrageous. They may have said it just right and the accusation is drawn from something twisted. Now, again, I want to emphasize, we want to work hard to explain God's truth as clearly and as accurately as we can, but there is a limit to what we can do. Sometimes we just have to endure these false accusations. Now, I don't know if you noticed when I read it, what it says there in verse 12, at the end of verse 12, it says, they came, seized him, and brought him to the council. They seized Stephen. They dragged him through the streets. It was like a mob roaming the streets, violent, crazy. You would just think, okay, it's, we, we see similar things in our own day and age. They took Stephen before this council known as the Sanhedrin, this tribunal. They come and they place him on the witness stand before they, they bring all these accusations that were twisted lies. There's this whole dramatic scene. Stephen is sitting before the very same council that condemned Jesus Christ to death and referred him to Pilate for crucifixion. Stephen's there, all these accusations. Now, I don't know about you, but when I get falsely accused, Especially, and this might be more meaningful to me as a preacher. When people say I said something that I didn't actually say, that it really bug, it gets under my skin. That can annoy me. It's kind of strange how it happens. And I, I know it happens, but people go, Pastor, you said, and I say, well, that's shocking. When did I say that? And you know, if you go through and lecture, well, okay, well, I did say this, but you didn't understand. Listen again to what I said. It, it can really be difficult when you're accused of saying things and you don't agree with them and, and you never said it. Stephen is in this position and he looks at the men of this council and he knows these same men sent Jesus to Pilate for crucifixion not long before this. So what was his reaction? Look at verse 15. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, they're staring at Stephen. Can you imagine being in Stephen's situation, looking back at all those eyes staring you down? It's like a Senate hearing or something like that. Well, it would be intimidating like that, don't you think? Really intimidating. No, I, I mean, I'm very grateful that in the political hearings that we have, I mean, it's not life or death on the line. Here, literally, it's life or death on the line. I'll read verse 12 again. And all, who, verse 15, I'm sorry. And all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. How could that be? How could, 
I, I read this. And face of an angel, first of all, let's understand what that means. It doesn't mean that he looked like one of those fat babies with wings, the cherub. You know, it doesn't mean that. That's not, that's a weird artistic expression of an angel. We, we gather this, the face of an angel, we gather this to mean that there was a serenity on his face. There was a confidence in his face, but especially there was a radiance to his expression. He's just smiling, maybe a little bit, shining forth with a radiance. There he is. How does that happen? I'll give you one aspect of this. It happened because of the work of the Holy Spirit in Stephen. Let me read to you from Luke chapter 12. Verses 11, 12. This is a fulfillment of a promise of Jesus. This is what Jesus said, Luke chapter 12, verses 11 and 12. Now, when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how you should answer or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. This is a fulfillment of the promise of Jesus the Holy Spirit, just as much as the Holy Spirit worked through Stephen to do signs and wonders, so the Holy Spirit was working through Stephen to give him calm in the midst of the storm. That is a genuine, powerful work of the Holy Spirit that you can ask for and receive today. Here he is just at peace. Lord, I believe. I believe that you can and you will give me the strength I need for this moment. So there is Stephen looking out at the council, the face of an angel, peaceful, confident, radiant. He knew that he was in God's hands and he knew that God never forsakes his people. And I think of this as we read verse 15, what an amazing scene there is Stephen with a face shining like an angel. There is the powerful council. I don't know exactly how many men were there staring at him. 30, 40, 50, maybe more. All those eyes staring at him intently, staring him down. And you think, what's going to happen here? There's these men who have lied and twisted what Stephen said. There's Stephen, just radiant and perfect peace. What tension there at that moment. What's going to happen next? You got to come back next week when Pastor Tommy <laughs> continues on into chapter 7. Because it's amazing what happens next. But, but let's leave it here. And let me make some concluding points here. Number one, Stephen was a great man. There's no doubt about it. But his greatness can be seen in how closely he was identified with Jesus, how he was associated with Jesus. And, and I want you to hear something. Peter, excuse me, Stephen Stephen was so identified with Jesus that, well, they even accused him falsely of many of the same things they accused Jesus of falsely. There he is, identified with Jesus. But we also are identified with Jesus. And I'm speaking to everybody who would consider themselves a follower of Jesus Christ, a disciple, a Christian. When we believe the good news of Jesus Christ and become Christians... At the invitation of Jesus, we consciously identify ourselves with Jesus. I am a Christian, a follower of Jesus. Now, he lives in us and we live in him. And Stephen, as a follower of Jesus, all these qualities were in him. 
And, and they were in him because he was identified with Jesus. That, that is the faith or the grace that's mentioned in verse 8. The power that's mentioned in verse 8. The compassion that's mentioned in verse 8. The wisdom that's mentioned in verse 10. The, the filling of the spirit that we also saw in verse 10. All of those things are great. But again, if we will be associated with Jesus in all the positive things, after all, who in this here, in this room, who doesn't want more faith? Who doesn't want more spiritual power? Who doesn't want more wisdom or compassion? We're all on for those things. But let me say this. Identifying with Jesus in those things also means that we identify with Jesus when he is falsely accused. And we are also falsely accused for his sake. Remember this, that in the end, Stephen will share in some way the fate of Jesus. I'm not trying to spoil the story for you. We'll get to it in coming weeks. But just like Jesus, Stephen will be condemned by this council and killed. It'll be in a different manner than Jesus was. But the end result is going to be the same. For Stephen and for us, we can't just follow Jesus for the good things. We need to be in with identifying with Jesus and following him, even when it would be difficult and we would face difficult things for his sake. Brothers and sisters, we, we need to be real about this. And this is what Stephen shows us. I, I love this phrase. It's what the apostle Paul, that guy Saul of Tarsus, would later write in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. As we follow Jesus, it's like this. Paul said, that I may know him. Praise the Lord. Who doesn't want to know Jesus? We all do. And the power of his resurrection. We're like, oh, glory. I want that power of his resurrection. Yes, Lord. And then Paul says this in the last line of Philippians 3.10. And the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. So we receive it all. Yes, the great things and the hard things. And we say, Lord, we want to be the followers of Jesus Christ. So, brothers and sisters, right now, by faith, consciously identify yourself with Jesus Christ. You in him and he in you. And let that be the biggest part of your identity. It will bring you tremendous blessings but I'll be straightforward with you. Also might bring some trouble your way. But even with the trouble that it may bring you, God will be with you and God will be glorified in the midst of it. Your face may not shine like an angel, but it won't be worse. I promise you that. It can only get better as we endure these things in Jesus Christ. Let me pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the power. Thank you for the goodness that you work in and through men like Stephen. But Lord, we believe, we know, we understand that you haven't stopped working through regular people. <laughs> that it wasn't just through Jesus. It wasn't just through the apostles. But Lord, it is also through people like us. And so Lord, we just say we're in. We trust you. We love you. And we ask that whatever we have, whether it's great blessing, Father, that's obvious, or whether it's trouble that comes our way for being faithful followers of Jesus, Lord, we just want to be close to Jesus every step of the way. Thank you for that, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.